Welcome everybody. Welcome to a new segment we're calling Great Love. With the launch of Heartbreak.run, we wanted to bring back some of the uh, great loves that we've had throughout our experience at Heartbreak. And we're going back to the original coach of Hill Club when we launched Heartbreak Hill, the store, in 2012. And I would like to welcome our special guest, Tim Ritchie. What's up, Dan? What's up, everybody at Heartbreak? So, Tim, a professional athlete for Saucony, he is a USA Marathon champ, he is a current cross-country coach at UMass, and that, those are all current accolades back when he overlapped with us as a, as a slightly younger man. Tim was a four minute, uh, sub four minute miler, a sub, correct me on this one, sub 29, 10K? Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, you were running for the BAA at the time, and you had not run a marathon yet. Right. Yeah, 2012. I was still uh, wide-eyed. Yeah. So we opened, uh, we opened Heartbreak in April 2012, right before the marathon, and uh, I credit Tim with a lot of the coaching uh, experiences that are now embedded into the fabric of Heartbreak. The first one is just as the first coach of Hill Club, one of the things that you did that blew my mind at the time was just you did the workouts by time. Having people run up the hill by time. The ultimate leveler. <laughs> can, can you talk about yeah. those early days of Hill Club, what it was like to coach? Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I mean, uh, we were just hoping to get some uh, some bodies out there on the hill and uh, just kind of put our feelers out in the community. And we we're really stoked at the early turnout. And, um, you know, we, we had people show up. And I remember and at the time we did about a two-mile warm-up. Um, the opposite direction on a marathon course and we had an athlete complete that warm up and that was the furthest they've ever run their whole life and <laughs> it was kind of a um, an important moment for me in my coaching career when I recognized um, how valuable every achievement is for every athlete you know it's not just my collegiate guys or, or myself at, at a really high level um, this is something we all share and so yeah we did all sorts of variations on the hill. You could come up with something different every night of the week there. And we did a lot of time-based stuff. So everybody, you know, if you're running hard for 30 seconds and you're getting to the top of the hill or you're getting halfway up the hill or you're getting a third of the way up the hill, you still push your body hard for 30 seconds. That's also, that's something we all did together. So it was a way to kind of unite, um, unite everybody in, in one common goal. Yeah. Well, anybody who's done a heartbreak workout uh, with me ever knows that kind of feel that's we use that very often still at all the heartbreak sessions over there at the hill at our store at mile 20 and also in boston common i don't always say your name every single practice uh but people may falsely attribute that to me and it's uh here's the guy it's, it's all him. so uh, that was one of the cool. many contributions you made let's talk about that first marathon your first marathon was the 2013 boston marathon uh i remember you know, you were the, the fastest guy in town, but you were, you were looking to debut as fastest first Boston by a Massachusetts resident or something? <laughs> I don't know if I was all that cute. Um, a lot more people were queued up on the the potential achievements than I was. I was just trying to run hard and do something big and um, really kind of throw myself into into the marathon and, and take some big risks early on and see and see what happens, so... Um, you know, we had, we had competitive goals. We wanted to, uh, beat guys. Yeah. Um, and yeah. then however that shook out in the papers, uh, it would be a, an additional thing. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk about the race that day? Obviously it was a fateful day for, for, uh, for Boston. We don't need to get into that so much, but in terms of the racing, uh, it's, it's not often that we, that at least me personally or members of our community get to be, uh, so, uh, close to uh, an, an athlete at, at that stage and to see you rise to, to what you've achieved since then. Uh, there are so many lessons to just see talking to you that week after, I remember, that, that I still talk about every single time I talk about uh, the marathon to a group. So can you talk about uh, some things you learned? I remember your fueling strategy for that first marathon uh, and, and some things mentioned about that at the time. Yeah, um, we were kind of learning on the fly. My coach at the time, Matt Kerr, I was his first marathoner, and this was my first marathon, and um, we were okay with learning things the hard way um, in our training and, and in how we approached the race. You know, we wanted to 
be unique and um, really look at who I was as an athlete and how I like to race and how I like to train and and apply that to the marathon versus the other way around, taking this marathon and trying to squeeze it into uh, who I am. Um, and for the most part, it's been successful. I mean, I definitely failed more marathons than I've succeeded, but the ones that I've done well have gone have gone pretty well. And I think to to achieve big things, you got to take big risks and um, but yeah, I mean, that first Boston, we definitely learned some lessons. Fueling was a big one. Uh, apparently you have to do that in a marathon. Uh, so lesson learned there. Um, and then especially as a Bostonian at the time, it was really difficult for me to be patient in my training. You're out there every weekend running by Heartbreak Hill with thousands of other people. And, um, I was just recently talking to a uh, talking to another athlete about my training for that race and found some old logs. And, mm. um, I was doing some crazy, crazy long runs <laughs> in that buildup is probably could have been the fittest I've ever been in my whole life. Um, uh, which probably cost me in the race. So right. learning how to bottle up that excitement during the buildup that you get from training in Boston. Um, but, but just bottle it and save it for race day, uh, versus using it every Saturday and Sunday of the 10 weeks leading into the race. So those are my, my two biggest lessons for sure. Yeah. So yeah, I remember specifically, uh, regarding your fuel, uh, when you, when you hit the wall and you put on a great face for, for us there at mile 20, as we were cheering you by, we had our run Richie campaign there. We had our gorilla. Everybody was fired up to see you. You looked great when you crossed us, but you said you were in massive pain after, and you talked about the fueling in particular. And I always remember your quote just saying, the guys, this is before uh, Morton existed, so you, you had just said, all the guys in front of me were popping Roctane nonstop, so I use Roctane <laughs> from there on out. And, and that, I'm sure it wasn't just that alone, but that was definitely one of your learnings about fueling specifically. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of it comes down, like some of my mentors in the sport were a lot of these uh, Greater Boston Track Club guys like Bill Rogers and Randy Thomas, and so I was talking to Randy, and he's like, just drink water, it's a race. Um, cause that was the mindset back then was just, uh, and that was one of the reasons why they, they transformed the marathoning world at the time was they didn't look at it as something, um, overpowering. It was just a race for them. And I think that's what led them to be successful. So I, I might've taken that advice a little too, <laughs> too strongly from RT, but, um, yeah, since then I've been working hard on carbo loading and trying to pay attention to that, you know, fueling on a daily basis. But then, yeah, Roctane and, uh, yeah, I was amazed at, at what these, these elite athletes can take in in a two hour run. Yeah. I remember, uh, another, another point you mentioned in your training, uh, that, that I adopted into heartbreaker training is, is a time on feet run. I remember at the time you, you had, I don't remember if, I don't think you would run more than 20 miles at a time before the marathon. Is that correct? Um, yeah, I think I might have done a 22, yeah. but when we were doing that, we were, uh, hammering. Yeah. And so, um, <laughs> I had never, I hadn't run over two hours. Right. And I remember you saying yeah. that, that feeling of like having just not been on your feet that long was, was new on the day. Um, and, yeah. and, and that you, you had actually said that to me, like maybe I need to throw in a time on feet run. And I just took that idea and said, I'm making all my athletes who are on the faster side slow way down and just get used to running that long for one of their key training runs. Yeah, absolutely. That, and then, so I did that, that fall, um, I added two, uh, two a 30 and a two forty five into the routine and, um, yeah, and off seven minutes off my marathon and finished a six at the U S champs that year. So, um, yeah, it was hard for me and I like running fast. And so, uh, <laughs> as somebody transitioning from shorter distances or the track, um, that was one of the things I had to let go, but it was great. Now I love the long run and just kind of getting out there and uh, just enjoying some company or some time with nature. Yeah. So we we call this great loves, and one of our one of our uh, one of our great loves at Heartbreak is our foundational distance course. There we call it the Firehouse. Uh, you and I are both BC alum. Uh, you know, I remember as a, a lowly 800 meter runner uh, coming into cross country camp for the first time and being dragged out on, on a firehouse uh, and no, having never run anywhere near 10 miles, choosing on my first version, uh, the chestnut seven mile option. <laughs> but every uh, stud cross country runner, including my business partner, would get dragged by the upperclassmen through that 10 mile firehouse run. So we, 
since we lit since the store is on that same course that we were fortunate enough to run in college, we have that 10 mile signature course uh, as as a key piece of our our store and our Boston Marathon preparation. And you, sir, are the undisputed king of the firehouse loop with a 49-13. Yes. <laughs> 49-13 done in um, March of 2014. So that not only did you run it in 49-13, but it was miles 5 through 15 of a 20-miler. Um, can you talk about that day and uh, what powered that to be uh, your greatest run? <laughs> <laughs> the greatest yeah. run at the firehouse ever. Um, I love the firehouse. Like, uh, yeah, I, for years, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty simple athlete. Uh, I would either do the trails bouncing or I do firehouse. And those are the only two runs I would ever do when I was at DC. And every time we did firehouse, I would just lay down, lay down the hammer on the Newton Hills. But, uh, yeah, that was a special day. Um, yeah, the, uh, it was a significant time in my life. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I think what you're hinting at is the uh, because we talked about this before, but yeah, the night before that race was um, my first kiss with my now wife. So talk about something to lift you off your feet. Uh, <laughs> that did it for me. So um, it was awesome. It was kind of funny. It wasn't the most ideal race uh, training prep. You know, we we were uh, back home in Worcester. We were having a great night and stayed up late and. Everything was great, but I knew I was meeting my coach at 8 a.m. the next morning, so we, we got up really early and <laughs> drove back to Boston, and um, I met him at the at BC to uh, head out for a long run, and um, yeah, I was just on cloud nine, so <laughs> it was easy. Um, it was easy to get out there and start start ripping some miles when there was a lot of goodness in, in my life at that time, but uh, um, that was also one of those March weekends where the course is just loaded with inspiration. So um, there was a lot of people out there either cheering me on or uh, yelling at me <laughs> for making them look bad uh, as we're cruising from the hospital uh, back up to BC. Nice. That's a great love story. I think uh, having having uh, your your foundational love story overlap with heartbreak uh, and 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 the firehouse course. Um, I think makes this an exceptionally fun kickoff to our, our new great love segment. And Tim, you've always been an incredible friend and, and mentor and so generous with your spirit um, with heartbreak and a, and a way that um, you've never held back and really made uh, our store better and our community better. And uh, I really want to say thanks for everything you've done for us. And cheers. You're the first great love. Yeah. Story. Okay. I appreciate it. Yeah. Keep up the great work. Happy to be a part of this grown community. So really proud of you guys. Thanks so much, Dan. All right.